Welcome back to Wrong Sports and the final part in my series on college football's big events, games, teams, massive changes, and scandals that happened during the 1950-51 season. It started with my How the Year Was 1-1950 episode, and then the last three episodes I did on scandals and big incidents that changed college football forever. In this final episode, I'm going to be going over something different as I'm going to cover the final seasons of the University of San Francisco football team and especially their final season, the 1951 season, which was their best season in their college's history, which is still being talked about to this day. But before I get to that, quickly subscribe below and ring the bell for brand new videos. Also, as always, check out my podcast, my Patreon, and my social media in the description below, and like and share this video with other college football fans. So when I first started this channel about four years ago, I did a video on the University of San Francisco basketball team that ended their program and then brought it back. And you can actually check out that story in the upper right-hand corner. But the University of San Francisco Don's football program started in 1917 when the school was still known as St. Ignatius College. And I cannot find full schedules for them until 1925. But here's something cool or or maybe a little weird too. Uh, This school, along with being known as St. Ignatius College, would also have the team nickname of the Gray Fog, which I think is kind of cool. They would keep the nickname, but the name of the school would change to the University of San Francisco in June of 1930, with the team changing their name halfway through their 1930 football season. And that 1930 season would actually be their best from their first two decades of playing. And throughout most of the first 30 years of play for University of San Francisco, they would play California schools, with their biggest rivals being schools that were just like them, smaller religious-backed schools, and mostly from the San Francisco area, such as Santa Clara and St. Mary's, but they also had an L.A. rival in LMU, or Loyola Marymount. They were also known as Loyola at that time, as their other big rival. These four schools would play each other pretty much every year. There would be a few exceptions due to war, but these schools always played one another and made a lot of athletic decisions based on one another, and you'll be hearing more about that later. And after World War II, San Francisco would get two noteworthy coaches for one year apiece in Maurice Clipper Smith for 1946 and Ed McKeever for 1947. McKeever for that 1947 year was pretty significant because he was a Notre Dame assistant through the 1940s before becoming an interim coach for 1944 and brought some Notre Dame alumni with him, one being his line coach, who was a former Notre Dame player in the mid-1930s, Joe Kaharick. Kaharick would take over from McKeever when he left to coach in a new pro league. And Kaharick was well known because of his Notre Dame time, as he played under head coach Elmer Layden, who was a part of Notre Dame's famed Four Horsemen, and Layden would call Kaharick his smartest player he ever had. After that, Kaharick would play pro for the Chicago Cardinals, but only for a few years during World War II. He would then get into coaching, becoming a line coach for the Steelers for a year, and then ending up at San Francisco. So this was Kaharick's first coaching job, so he wasn't really good at all aspects of it. One being recruiting, as he would often have his assistants do it for him. That was because Kaharick loved to coach and mentor while bringing his teams together as a family. This would mostly come in handy as the team was integrated, as most were starting to be, and making sure that all of his players could be a team, he became the father figure to many. This wasn't seen to the public because Kaharick was a shy man, who in his first coaching job was very nervous about keeping his job. And after his first season of 1948, he was especially nervous, because they went 2-7. and seven. But then the next two years, he would have breakout seasons as they went 7-3 and three in 1949. And in 1950, they added Stanford and Cal to the schedule, and they went 7-4. and four. Plus, they gave undefeated Cal a game as they only lost by six points towards the end of the season. And you can give a lot of praise to Coach Kaharick and his coaching. But remember how I mentioned that a lot of his assistants did a lot of his recruiting? Well, a lot of praise should be given to them. Well, mostly left to his freshman coach, though, Brad Lynn, who did pretty much all of his recruiting. And Lynn was mostly left on his own to do that, as he had little to offer prospective players in the way of scholarship perks beyond tuition, board, and a room, which was in an old ROTC barracks. So the room and board wasn't really all that good. Along with that, USF was not a big school, as in 1951, the enrollment was only 1,276, and it was all male, 
But with all that, Lynn didn't deter as he mostly stayed in San Francisco area to recruit and he showed off the beauty of the campus to get recruits into the school. And the sales pitch worked as Lynn got a lot of really good talent from all different backgrounds. There were a lot of players that were important to this turnaround, but I'm going to focus on four of them. I'm going to start with the most interesting player on the team. That was Gino Marchetti, and he quit high school in 1944 to join the Army during World War II. He became a machine gunner just in time for one of the more famous battles, the Battle of the Bulge. Marchetti would survive that battle and get discharged from the army in 1946. He then went to live the beach bum life in Northern California for a year before going to Modesto Junior College along with his brother. He played there for one season in 1950 before Lynn would see him during a game and offered him a spot on the team due to Marchetti's strength, size, and experience since Marchetti was 25 at this point. Marchetti would play defensive end and offensive tackle for the Dons for the 1951 season. The next important player was their best player in Ali Madsen. He was originally born in Texas, but had to move to San Francisco with his mother when he was 13. His mother originally wanted him to be a dentist and go to college, and Madsen would do that, but not for dentistry, as he would go for his amazing sports skills. In his senior season at San Francisco's Washington High, he scored a record 17 touchdowns in seven games. And in track, he would also set records there. But even though he showed off his sports skills in high school, he wasn't heavily recruited. That was mostly because he was a black player. And he didn't immediately go to University of San Francisco, as he would start at City College of San Francisco in 1948. And in that one year, he managed to set a national junior college record by scoring 19 touchdowns in 11 games. The next season, Brad Lynn would get him into the school, and as a sophomore at USF, he scored seven times, including a 92-yard touchdown run. His junior season of 1950, he only played one-third of the season, but he still managed to run for 747 yards. He would be healthy for his senior season of 1951, and he would build on that junior season. Finally, though, Matson would come to University of San Francisco with another great player in Burl Toller. Toller was out of Memphis, but never really played football while he was there, as he was the water boy mostly. After high school, he headed west and went to City College of San Francisco in 1948. He would walk on the football team there, and due to his athletic ability that wasn't seen in high school, he shined as a linebacker for one season and would follow Madsen to University of San Francisco and be a superstar on their 1949 and 1950 seasons. Finally, another one of their famous players was a local star in Bob St. Clair. He would play at San Francisco Poly, which was located right across the street from the University of San Francisco, and they also played at the same stadium, so he wouldn't be going very far for college. St. Clair as a freshman in 1949 would be massive as he was 6'5", and by his junior year of 1951, he would be 6'9", and be the best blocker in the nation. With these four plus 30 others, the University of San Francisco Dons were ready for another winning season. But behind the scenes, there was trouble brewing. That trouble was money. And if you watched any of my discontinued episodes, you could actually see a playlist in the upper right hand corner right now. You will know that every time a college program has trouble with money, they usually let go one of the sports programs. And with it happening at University of San Francisco, as they were running on a deficit of $70,000 every year they played football, this one was on the chopping block. Playing with a deficit wouldn't really help the program as they would rarely play big time schools from outside of California. And if they did, they mostly did it on the road, which back in the 1950s didn't guarantee a huge payday for these college programs. But even when the Dons would play at home, they didn't have all that big of a fan base there to watch them play as they would rarely have over 20,000 fans for their game, which was not even half of their home stadium, Keysar Stadium, which held 50,000 fans. The only time this team did draw well was when they would play other local rivals like St. Mary's and Santa Clara, and that was because all three of these teams played at the same stadium, so it was like having two home crowds for these games. Along with the small crowds, they also had professional football in the city, as the San Francisco 49ers just started after the war and would compete in the new All-American Football Conference in this growing city. 
The biggest thing that showed just how bad this situation was about to get for the school was that one of their biggest rivals, St. Mary's, shockingly would end their football program just days after the 1950 season. That left University of San Francisco with a spot open in their schedule this year, too. And that was another problem for the school. Remember how I mentioned it was tough for them to draw fans to games? Well, since that didn't happen, it was also tough for them to get good teams to come play them. They played Cal and Stanford in 1950, but they did that on the road. And according to Coach Kaharick, this was not really confirmed. Neither team wanted to play University of San Francisco again in 1951, as they didn't want to lose to them because they saw just how good they were going to be this year. Due to all those teams not wanting to schedule them for 1951, Coach Kaharick had to have a patchwork schedule done. And that would be seen as they would play an extra game versus San Jose State. They would play a home-at-home -home series against them, along with two more games against service teams, as they would play Camp Pendleton and their Marine team and the San Diego Naval Training Center. In fact, the only teams on University of San Francisco's schedule that year with football reputations were Fordham, who they were playing on the road, Santa Clara, College of the Pacific, and Loyola of Los Angeles. But those last three were more well-known locally than nationally, even though Loyola had gone 8-1 in 1950, and Pacific would have future Chicago Bear halfback Eddie Macon on there. More on him in a moment, too. So with that patchwork schedule not really looking like they would sell out games, it would be a huge project for their head of public relations, the 25-year-old Pete Roselle. Roselle was from the LA area, who after the war entered Compton Community College in 1946. While there, he worked as the student athletic news director and also worked part-time for the Los Angeles Rams as a public relations assistant. But Roselle's life would change. After Pete Newell, who was the coach for the University of San Francisco Don's basketball team, came to Compton in 1948 for a recruiting visit, and he was impressed by Roselle and managed to get him a job at University of San Francisco on a full scholarship as a student publicist for the Don's athletic department. Roselle would graduate USF in 1950, and he was hired by the school as a full-time athletic news director. Roselle had clear marketing and creative skills, and knew one big way to market this team was to have a Heisman candidate, and he would go with who he thought was their best player. That would be Ollie Madsen. With Roselle heavily pushing Madsen and the team, in the hopes of saving this team, Kaharick would get this team ready for their 1951 season and Matson would prove that Heisman prediction correct, as he had two touchdowns of 40-plus yards as they crushed San Jose State in their first game, 39-2. Then Matson would gain 232 yards in a 28-7 win over Idaho in their second game. Matson would continue to improve with five touchdowns over the next two games as the Dons went 4-0 as they would travel to New York City to play Fordham in their fifth game. And this game was a big one, as it would give USF some pretty big attention as they were playing in New York City. And Roselle knew that, as he managed to get a handful of newspaper writers to the game to witness Madsen and the Dons. And as soon as this game started, Madsen would shine, as he had three touchdowns, two of them being 90-plus yard kickoff returns, as he did one on the first play of the game. And they needed all that from Madsen, as San Francisco had to score in the final minute to win 32-26 to keep their perfect season going. After that hard game, USF made easy work of their next two games as Madsen piled up 249 yards rushing against San Diego Navy Training Center and 228 yards against Santa Clara as they won 26-7 in both of those games. So now USF was 7-0, and they were ranked in the top 15, with two games left against two of their biggest California rivals. Along with that, though, there would be rumors that USF would be going to a bowl game, which was pretty big since in 1951, there were only six bowl games. But they played Pacific next, and this game would be on the road, and Pacific was one of the best Western teams due to beating Clemson this year and Oregon early in the season. Also, they had a star on their team in running back Eddie Macon. 
San Francisco, though, would have their best game of the year during this one, as they ran all over Pacific, with Madsen having two touchdowns and 175 yards rushing as the Dons won 47-14. That win would be a final high for the team, as they would travel to the Rose Bowl, but not to play in the bowl game, as they would play Los Angeles school Loyola. And Loyola was going through the same money troubles as USF, and they weren't drawing big crowds, which looked even smaller in the massive Rose Bowl. This game was no exception, as this game only drew 15,000, as USF would win 20-2. to This game would be even more significant for both, and I'll explain that in just a moment, though. But USF would end their season 9-0 and ranked just outside of the top 10. According to stories, though, from some USF players and coaches, they were invited to the Orange Bowl, but only if they left behind their best players, Ali Madsen and Burl Toller. The reason for this was because this game was in Florida, which was still under segregation, meaning that Ali Madsen and Burl Toller couldn't play in the Orange Bowl at all. They couldn't even enter the stadium. Due to this, USF told them harshly that they were not going to be going to the bowl game. There would be no other bowl game that would invite them. Years later, though, Orange Bowl organizers have come out to say USF was never going to be invited to the bowl game. The reason was their weak schedule, and the fact that the bowl game would invite two higher-ranked teams to the game, as they invited top-10 team Georgia Tech and Baylor to the game. And the Orange Bowl has always kept that position through the years as well, and the only way I can see that USF believed that they were going to be going to the Orange Orange Bowl was because the newspapers were writing it, with maybe Roselle helping that too, as you can find many articles predicting USF to go to a bowl game, and I mean, they really should since they were one of the better teams in the nation. But back in the 1950s, there were only a dozen teams that went to bowl games unlike now, so you really had to campaign your team to get in, and USF being a small school, not having a good schedule, and also not being at a conference to have a tie-in to a bowl game, they really had to do a lot of that. and it just didn't work out for them. But here's something important that did happen during the bowl season, as the Sun Bowl would break barriers, as they would invite a segregated Pacific team to the game, and Pacific would accept that invite. And with that invite, Pacific and their running back, Eddie Macon, became the first segregated team, and he would become the first black player to play in the Sun Bowl. So even though USF was not going to be breaking barriers, some barriers were being broken this year. And I want to go back to USF, since their season was over and they weren't going to a bowl game. But rumors would swirl that USF, which again was losing upwards of $70,000 on the sport every season, was going to drop the sport. Along with that, Loyola, who was a big rival of USF, was also having trouble fielding a team. They said that this was due to the Korean War, which was taking away college-age men. Coach Kaharik, who sensed the inevitable, would resign from USF to accept the head coaching job in the NFL with the Chicago Cardinals. That would just be a precursor as on December 30th, the Reverend and President of University of San Francisco, William J. Dunn, issued this announcement. It is with my unpleasant task to inform you of the withdrawal of the University of San Francisco from participation in intercollegiate football. He said it in better terms, and I'll put the full quote here, but basically they wanted to end it because it put a financial strain on the university, and of course the school wanted to be an academic school and not a school that was in debt due to a sport. With USF now ending their program, and St. Mary's ending their program the year before, Loyola of LA, now known as Loyola Marymount University, would follow suit and end their program only days later. This left Santa Clara as the only college using Kizar Stadium in San Francisco for the 1952 season. They would only use it one time that season, though, and you can see more about their program and how it ended in my discontinued episode. I'll put a link above to that. These four programs all played each other from 1910 through 1950, and by 1952, all four programs would be gone. USF would try and come back a decade or so later in the D2 level, but drop their program again. After the season, most of their really good players would find another school to go to or would go pro. Ali Madsen, who led the nation in rushing with over 1,500 yards, and he also led the nation in scoring with 126 points or 21 touchdowns, came in fifth in the Heisman race that year. But Madsen would do something really cool after the season, as he would head to Finland for the Olympics, and Madsen would win a bronze medal there in the 400 meters. 
Madsen would head to the NFL right after that and play for 12 years and is in the NFL and College Football Hall of Fames. Along with him going to the pros, Gino Marchetti would also go on to play pro and play for the Baltimore Colts for a decade, plus he won a few NFL titles and is also an NFL Hall of Famer. One of the players who I mentioned who had to go to another school was Bob St. Clair, as he would have to transfer to Tulsa for a year, but he would eventually go to play pro for a decade and play for his hometown team of the San Francisco 49ers. And fun fact for St. Clair, he played every football season except for one, that one season he played at Tulsa in 1952. He played it at the same stadium, Kizar Stadium, for every high school game, every college game except for one season and every professional football game so that's kind of cool. Burl Toller though would have the most interesting after University of San Francisco football career as it started in the college all-star game which was a game back in the 1940s and 50s that pitted the best players in college against an NFL team which sounds kind of crazy nowadays but this year's game was against the NFL champions the LA Rams which would also be insane for 2022 but Toller would play defensive end in the game and he would dominate in the game and he was looking like he would be the MVP but then in the fourth quarter after a blindside tackle he was out of the game and the tackle pretty much broke his leg he would be drafted by the browns and then he would be acquired by the cardinals in a trade that was engineered by his old coach coach kaharik but he would never report to the cardinals deciding that he didn't want the operation and instead wouldn't play football anymore he would go back to University of San Francisco, he got his teaching credentials and a master's degree in educational administration, and he became San Francisco's first black secondary school principal. Toller would also be an NFL official on the weekends and became the first black referee in a Super Bowl game. So I mentioned that coach Joe Kaharick left for the NFL before the team would disband and would coach in the NFL for about a decade. He coached for the Chicago Cardinals, then for the Eagles, then he would coach at his alma mater Notre Dame for five seasons with mediocre results at pretty much all of those stops. Pete Rozelle, meanwhile, would make his way through the public relations of teams in the NFL to become the NFL commissioner less than two decades after he was running the PR department at the University of San Francisco. Pete Rozelle would go down as the most important person in the rise of the NFL in America and around the world. To go along with Roselle and the coaches and the players above, nine total players from this 1951 USF team would play in the pros, which was just absolutely insane at the time. It's insane for now. That would be like if nine players from an FCS team all got drafted in the NFL. But back to the big story here, which was the closure of an undefeated college football team, which was clearly big news, but if you followed the money, it made all the sense for the college to end this team. This was at a time in college football where there wasn't any divisions like there is now, so schools of any size could play one another. This could be good and bad, as in the case of USF, they could play Cal and Stanford and get the media attention and also make some money with the game, but it would only last for that week. It really didn't carry over for the rest of their season. Also, I think the San Francisco market was saturated after World War II with football with the addition of the professional San Francisco 49ers. To go along with that, there were three small colleges all playing in the same stadium, so that also wouldn't help with University of San Francisco to build a fan base. Plus, with Stanford and the Cal Bears all in the San Francisco area, if a fan wanted to see college football, they could pick those two top schools over the smaller colleges in the city. But I wanted to cover the ending of the University of San Francisco program as it coincided with three other closures of programs I mentioned earlier, which all showed that small college football needed a change and also needed some help to survive. They would get that, but it would also take about, you know, a decade or two to get the divisions of college football we have now, organizing colleges based on scholarships and money spent on teams. If Division I, FCS, Division II, Division III were around in the 1950s, USF might not have been a D1 school, and they'd probably still be playing to this day, most likely in Division III, just based on their school size. But tell me what you think about the closure of the University of San Francisco football program in the comments below. And if you haven't checked out the other episodes from my four-part series about the scandals and big events of 1950-1951, check them out in the playlist to the side or on the screen right now. 
And also, please help out the channel by subscribing and ringing the bell so you can get updates on brand new videos. I will be dropping more videos towards the summer. And of course, you can check out my Patreon, my podcast, and my social media in the description below. And thank you so much for checking out this four-part series on the 1951 scandals and big events.